I'm Julie Bartke with this Senate update. A new surcharge on motor vehicle transfers and an increase to the gas tax. These are just two of the more controversial provisions in the Senate Transportation and Public Safety Bill, Senate File 87. Committee members heard public testimony on this bill on Friday, and here is a portion of that testimony. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 87, a transportation plan that will provide the resources and policy changes needed to improve the safety and efficiency of the transportation system, including roads, bridges, transit, bike and pedestrian infrastructure all across the state. Uh, we are especially supportive of the fact that this bill does provide a systemic approach to dealing with our transportation problems um, because transportation is a system and functions like a system and all the parts need to work together in order to function safely and efficiently. Without a sustainable long-term plan, the legislature will simply be kicking the can down the road, increasing costs for taxpayers and leaving important safety problems unaddressed. I would like to focus um, in particular on the portion of the bill that reforms the fuel tax. And you should all have um, a copy of a handout that we provided um, from the Transportation Alliance that has some charts and graphs on it. And one of the things that um, was discussed a little bit in the last committee hearing is the issue of why the per gallon tax um, is not working as well as it has been in the past and why we want to see a change in the process of collecting the fuel tax. So you'll see that um, fuel consumption has been going down and is projected to continue going down. Uh, Minnesota will see a pretty dramatic decline in the number of gallons of fuel purchased in the state by 2032. So this is a critical change that we um, think really needs to be in the bill so that the fuel tax functions just like the other two constitutionally dedicated revenue sources that go into the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. So um, just as the motor vehicle sales tax and the license tab fees are collected as a percentage of the price or value of motor vehicles, um, because of that, the revenue naturally increases as the price of vehicles increases. So our goal is to also have the fuel tax function the same way, so that it is charged as a percentage of the price, and therefore the revenue will increase as the price of fuel increases. Uh, to give you an example, in 1980, the average fuel efficiency for cars was 24.3 miles per gallon. In 2013, that was up to 36 miles per gallon. So the average driver is purchasing a little over 200 fewer gallons of fuel every year. And while this provides a substantial cost savings for people, for all of us drivers, um, it also means that the revenue for keeping our roads and bridges safe and in good repair is not keeping up with cost increases and inflation. A 16 cent per gallon increase in the user fee um, would certainly still provide a cost savings for drivers over what people were paying in 1980. This is not a new or radical policy to have a sales tax on fuel. 19 states charge a sales tax on fuel and even more are considering this approach in order to deal with the inherent problem with the per gallon tax. Um, for those who say they have no problem with an increase in the per gallon fuel tax, um, they should also have no problem with the gross receipts tax on fuel, which retains the same features as the per gallon tax. It is constitutionally dedicated to roads. It will literally simply change the per gallon rate. All the same exemptions apply. And there is no change in the transparency of the tax. The tax will be collected in exactly the same manner, at exactly the same level, the wholesale level, and with the same amount of transparency as today's fuel tax. With a significant budget surplus in the general fund, um, some have su suggested using general fund dollars to pay for road and bridge improvements. And while this approach would certainly help fix some roads and bridges in the short term, we know from past experience that transportation does not do well competing in the general fund. And so another handout that we've provided shows the statutory dedication of the motor vehicle sales tax to transportation, uh, which was first passed in 1981. 
And under the 1981 law, all of the motor vehicle sales tax revenue was supposed to be transferred to transportation by 1990. Um, of course, that didn't happen. And uh, for many years, there was no revenue from the motor vehicle sales tax being used for transportation. As a consequence, transportation lost over $6 billion in revenue that was supposed to go to transportation under this law. And it was only with the passage of a constitutional amendment that we now have 100% of that revenue being used for transportation. So this is why we are very um, concerned about making sure that the revenue we rely on for transportation are those constitutionally dedicated revenue sources. Um, I would just like to conclude by saying, you know, this all kind of boils down to who bears the responsibility for paying for the transportation system. Will it be the users of the system, the drivers, the truckers, the people purchasing vehicles, paying a little bit more, which under this bill is basically about the cost of a cup of coffee a week for the average driver, or will property owners and businesses within certain transportation corridors be charged much more to cover the cost of these investments? With the fuel tax, those who drive more pay more, and with the gross receipts tax, the state will put in place a mechanism to fund our roads and bridges that will serve Minnesotans today and well into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Donahoe. And if we can have everybody sort of lined up pretty quickly so that everybody can have as much time to testify, that would be great. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Dave Van Hedem. I'm with Transit for Livable Communities and one of the co-chairs of Move MN, along with Margaret Donahoe. Uh, Move MN is a very diverse coalition, but all 200 plus organizations support uh, Senate File 87 and all components of that bill. I will speak to the metro area transit components of the bill, maybe very briefly touch on bike and pedestrian in the metro. Um, as you heard on Wednesday, the transit uh, includes 20 additional transit ways and a 27% increase in the bus system over the next 10 years. I'm going to just quickly outline, outline three reasons why it's imperative that we make this investment in building out our transit system and conclude with why the metro sales tax is the right tool to do that. So first, the transit build out enhances our economic competitiveness. The Itasca project, a business group, uh, conducted a return on investment study of building out this system of uh, metro-wide transitways. They found that for every dollar invested, we'll see a return of $3 in direct <laughs> economic benefits. The majority of those benefits are actually a reduction in travel delay for everyone using the system. So the, the benefits are primarily to drivers and to goods movement, but also to transit uh, users. The other benefits are reduced car costs for those able to use transit, reduced emissions, and improved safety. Uh, second, the transit build-out will increase access to opportunity. Currently, only 15% of jobs in the Twin Cities metro are conveniently served by transit. Imagine what it would be like if you were job hunting but couldn't afford a car and had to rule out 85% of the jobs in the region. This is a very significant problem, and this bill will substantially improve affordable transportation access. Third, we need to address the change in demand in, in our transportation system. Transportation is fundamentally a question of supply and demand, and the demand is changing. We saw a 14% increase in transit ridership over the last decade in the metropolitan area. We saw a 50% increase in bicycling in Minneapolis, St. Paul uh, and 14 adjoining communities. That's the situation today. It's gonna, that trend is only going to intensify with the choices that young people are making. Uh, to conclude, I just want to say a few words about the increase in the sales tax, the three-quarter cent uh, increase to bring us to a full cent. This is in your packet. This compares the Twin Cities to peer regions. You'll see that many regions are at a full cent or more today fully dedicated to growing their transit system. You'll also see in the far right column what the total tax rate is. And were we to make this tax increase, we would still be on par with these peer regions. But the most important takeaway is what this investment builds. 
And the next uh, handout in your packet is just a couple of the systems around the country that our peers have built out. I would argue that they're at least a decade ahead of us, and we need the investment to catch up and to really provide uh, more options across the region. So to conclude, Senate File 87 is a very smart investment for Minnesota's future. Expanding transit choices will increase our economic competitiveness, expand affordable access to opportunity, and respond to the growing consumer demand for buses, trains, and active transportation. We applaud Senator Dibble and the committee. And uh, um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike Griffin, uh, who's here uh, this morning as well. Says one more time, I'm Mike Griffin. I'm here with Neighborhoods Organizing for Change, or NOC. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the committee for giving me, me the opportunity to testify. So Minnesota's transportation system is falling behind. As our population grows older and more diverse, more people depend on a full wide range of transportation choices. So NOC has been working with transit riders for the better part of two years. And we've heard from mothers who have to wait out in the cold with their children because buses were simply too crowded to board with their stroller. We've heard from workers up in St. Cloud who can't get home after their work shift because buses don't run late enough. And we've heard from people all over the state who want sidewalks and paths to be able to ride their bikes and walk safely. So everyone knows, or most people know, that Minnesota has one of the worst racial inequity gaps in the entire nation. These problems impact people of color the, the most severely. We need an equitable solution right now that doesn't turn a blind eye to the facts. We are asking for a solution that unites our communities. Public transportation serves best those who need it the most. Right now, once again, it is falling short. We call on the legislator to pass a comprehensive, long-term funding solution this session that builds a transportation system that benefits all Minnesotans. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Good Welcome morning. to the committee. Thank you. I'm Todd Klingel, the president of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce, and here with my partner, Steve Kramer, from the Downtown Council. The Chamber represents over 1,600 businesses across the metro, and our purpose is to grow jobs in this community. That growth is dependent upon businesses' ability to move goods, services, and employees in an efficient manner. This requires the appropriate transportation infrastructure, roads, bridges, and transit, and we support laying the groundwork for a 10-year solution right now. As congestion increases, that ability to conduct commerce will continue to weaken, impacting businesses in many ways. Our members have shared that their deliveries and service calls take longer, requiring more vehicles. Sales reps can't make as many calls each day, and commuting goes up, which is not only expensive, but diminishes quality of life. Our friends at Greater MSP tell us that questions about how our state is addressing transportation are among the first asked by those considering relocating here. Our success in addressing these issues will have a clear, positive impact on the economy. Success in business is risky enough without handicapping ourselves by not properly funding this vital infrastructure. Our chamber wants to keep this economy growing, so after reviewing the TFAC study and meeting with MnDOT Commissioner Zelli, we support annual increases for roads and bridges of 400 to 500 million dollars. And let me say how much we appreciate the commissioner's work. He's transforming that department, adding transparency, has already created millions of dollars in efficiencies, and knows what needs to be done. Of course, he did come out of the private sector. Now, let me address transit. We are immersed in a highly competitive economic ba uh, battle with regions across the country. Many of our closest competitors are spending considerably more than we are providing multimodal transportation options. Portland, for example, 50% more. Denver, twice as much. Seattle, three times as much. Tomorrow's workforce is highly mobile and highly sought. Minnesota does a good job of keeping most of those who are already here, but we are underperforming badly in attracting these high demand workers from elsewhere. Study after study informs us that the highly coveted folks want transportation options and those regions that accommodate them will prevail economically. Again, using TFAC as a base and working with the Met Council and CTIB, the Chamber supports annual increases of 160 to 200 million dollars for transit. The leading corporations in this state through the Itasca project that was already mentioned have shown the powerful economic return this investment would generate. Thank you. Mr. Klingel. Yep. Madam Chair, members, my name is Steve Kramer. I'm the President and CEO of Minneapolis Downtown Council, and our Executive Committee adopted a resolution in support of a half-cent uh, increase in the Metro sales tax 
for transit as part of a 10-year program to address Minnesota's overall transportation and transit infrastructure requirements. Our view is that this is an opportune moment to ensure that transit and transportation capacity throughout Minnesota becomes a competitive asset, not a looming liability. Downtown Council's vision for downtown Minneapolis is captured in our 2025 intersections plan, which has 10 goals, one of which is to lead the nation in transportation options. Uh, overall, our 2025 plan will result in a downtown with more residents, more workers, more green space, more entertainment and recreation options, and more vitality. All of that means downtown Minneapolis will be, in the future, an even stronger economic engine for the region and the state as a whole. But the key to arriving at this future is achieving the goal around more and better options for people to get to and from and around a growing, densifying downtown core. We believe the percentage of people using transit to access downtown must rise to 60% by 2025 from a little over 40% today. Having resources available to keep on pace completing the regional transportation policy plan, including improving the quality of bus service, is something the Downtown Council of Minneapolis strongly supports. The business executives who lead our organization have come to the conclusion that additional regional sales tax creates the stable and ongoing revenue source we need at this critical point. Other regions are making these investments. That point has been made. We must as well to remain competitive. And while our focus is on transit, we also recognize that an economically strong downtown Minneapolis is served well by an adequately funded statewide road and bridge network. I would conclude, Madam Chair, by saying uh, supporting additional taxes is not the first instinct of our board members, but in light of the compelling economic payoff they see in this case, after careful and long study, they have adopted this position. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Good morning and welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, my name is Abby Breiduck. I represent the Association of Minnesota Counties, which is a member membership organization of all 87 counties, which we've represented for over 100 years. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend the chair for putting together this um, well-balanced and thoughtful bill. I'd like to say a little bit about our county's needs and also the um, efficiencies and streamlining that we, we appreciate seeing in this bill. Counties were very involved in the Transportation Finance Advisory Committee process where um, we, we, got, we got together to identify, one of the things we had meant to do, were meant to do is identify the needs for our system. Um, the need number we came up with was 40, $450 million um, of an annual funding gap. Those were based on, that number was based on deficient bridges, uh, making strategic safety improvements, um, the transportation economic development requests, and the 10 ton road system build out, and the funding requests for the local road improvement program. Um, there's often a discussion about wants and needs. And, and I can assure you that the numbers that we derived at um, from this process were definitely the need, those identified for the needs on our system. <coughs> Uh, and this bill does go a long way in, in, in make, meeting that funding, funding gap, but most importantly, with the uh, long-term term sustainability we, we see from the gross receipts tax, um, this will give us an opportunity to grow our revenues in the future and also to provide efficiently for transportation. The long-term funding that we see here um, will allow us to bundle projects for cost savings, will allow us to plan the lowest cost fix at the optimum time, rather than a high cost when the money is available. It allows for a stable construction workload for contractors, which equals overall lower construction costs. And project development costs are increased dramatically by projects that need to be done on accelerated schedules, which we can office, often see with uh, one-time money or also with bonding. So the, the way this bill is structured and the way the revenue will come in will really go a long way in helping us to uh, to um, get at our funding gap, but also stretch the resources we have in the, in the most efficient way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Finn, welcome. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair and members. Um, my name is Ann Finn, and I represent the League of Minnesota Cities. We are an association representing 835 of Minnesota's 852. Uh, cities and with me today is Carolyn Jackson representing the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities um, and Todd Olson representing Metro Cities. I want to um, start by thanking you for um, holding meetings throughout the state and um, we feel that this bill really reflects what you heard at those meetings. Um, we 
recognize that this bill contains revenues for cities of all sizes statewide and most importantly we think it will provide property tax relief um, in the way of helping offset some of the costs of local infrastructure um, lastly before I um, yield to my colleagues here I want to um, share with you a list of cities that have passed resolutions um, supporting the provisions in this bill um, this is the stack of resolutions, which we didn't make for all of you, but we have a list of the cities that have passed them. Um, and at this point, the total is 137 cities that have uh, submitted these to us. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for holding this hearing. My name is Carolyn Jackson. I'm with the firm of Flaherty and Hood, and I represent the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. The coalition is 85 cities located in Greater Minnesota, over half of which are under, have a population under 5,000. Our top three pri our top priorities for transportation this year are long-term funding for corridors of commerce and funding outside the constitutional formula for all cities. This bill does that, and we are very grateful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Todd Olson with Metro Cities. We represent uh, 90 cities in the metropolitan area. Uh, cities do benefit when uh, state and county road and transit projects get funded, and we do support that in the bill. Mm -hmm. But uh, like my colleagues here, we are very interested in, the, in, the, in supporting the new funding that helps us maintain our own systems. Uh, most trips begin at, or end on a local street. And uh, as, as Carolyn said yesterday, uh, taking care of our local streets is good policy. So we do support the, those new funding streams in the bill. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Good morning. Welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Ken Sulem with the Minnesota Association of Townships. We represent 1,781 of the 1,783 townships in the state. <clears throat> it also means that we're representing 56,000 plus miles of road and 6,000 of the 13,000 uh, bridges in the state of Minnesota. We are seeing an increase in the number of those bridges that are falling on the structurally deficient list, the priority list, uh, but we also have a number of the bridges that are now functionally obsolete. Uh, they simply cannot handle, even though the weight-wise may be fine, they are not large enough to handle today's modern farm equipment. Uh, so then we have problems like rails being removed to make them a little easier to cross, but a great deal more unsafe. Transportation funding is absolutely uh, one of our top priorities for this session. We have to have a sustainable, long-term increase in funding that is stable uh, and dedicated so that we, too, can uh, continue to improve those roads work on the bridges. We have a number of efficiencies already built into law. For example, uh, box culverts are now recognized as bridges that was done several years ago and allows, uh, instead of spending a couple million dollars on a bridge, we can now get it down to around $200,000 for replacement. We're piggybacking off of co uh, county contracts. So we're letting bids once instead of twice, getting bulk rates in that manner. Uh, and of course, we can make use of the state cooperative purchasing uh, co uh, contract, and that is a great cost savings as well. Nonetheless, over, uh, between 52 and 58 percent of township budgets every year are spent on transportation. It's been the range for the last 10 years, 52 to 58 percent. We are 76 percent, actually we're over 76, property tax dependent. That's just not a sustainable model in rural Minnesota. We cannot continue to pump in that much, uh, over $155 million worth of road work, heavily funded only on property tax. Now what does that mean? Well, for us it means increasing the excise tax on the fuel. That is the percent that gets the most directly down to the rural roads. And so we know that's the controversial part of uh, the bill, but when you look at actually getting down to the gravel, getting back to true home roads in rural Minnesota, that's what it's gonna take. We need that dedication, we need that increase. Um, we do have a little bit of concern with some of the changes in the flex account, but nothing uh, serious enough to oppose this bill in any manner. We just wanna look at crunching some of the numbers. We absolutely need to see this go forward. How do we know? Well, our members consistently have approved our policy of supporting increases to the fuel tax. Last year, we submitted over 700 resolutions from town boards across the state in full support of the bill. This year, we've probably received about 100 postcards uh, reiterating that support. So with that, um, I will simply leave you with the message, rural Minnesota needs this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sulem.
Madam Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Sherry Munyon, and I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Public Transit Association. But first, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Cruikshan from St. Cloud Metrobus. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair and members, my name is Tom Cruikshank. I'm the Managing Director of Operations and Planning with Metropolitan Transit Commission, more commonly known as Metrobus in St. Cloud. Uh, I appreciate the time that you allow us today. Um, committee members, uh, several of you were in St. Cloud a couple of weeks ago to visit us. We had a chance to share a, a couple of issues that we face. Uh, it's very important to us in our St. Cloud area, and I want to share uh, a couple of those thoughts with you today. Uh, first of all, we're, we're at risk of losing the subsidies that allow our college students in the St. Cloud area to ride our transit system uh, unlimited. Um, you, you're all aware that the budget crisis that the uh, Minsk schools are facing, uh, our program that allows those students to ride our system uh, is in jeopardy. We need your help uh, to help restore uh, the funding that we're about to lose so that those students can continue to ride. When the program started 10 years ago, uh, our ridership went up 40%. We want to retain that ridership. It's very important for our community. If we uh, if we lose the, that ability for those students to ride, we're we're potentially going to have service cuts, decreased ridership, uh, potentially layoffs in our driver force. Uh, it will increase traffic congestion in and around the campus area, and uh, certainly going to reduce student safety by uh, having more students exposed to uh, traffic, uh, and especially late at night with some services potentially being cut. Uh, one other area that we uh, need your help in too is uh, St. Cloud is a growing area with uh, a senior and disabled population. Our paratransit system is the largest in greater Minnesota. It's continuing to grow. It's of concern to us in that we don't have the resources to provide long-term long stability in, in being able to uh, meet the demands of that population in our area without your help. Uh, again, we need uh, dedicated uh, transit funding. Uh, you need, we need more transit funding in Greater Minnesota so that we can provide these services. Um, we certainly appreciate your help. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, members, again, Sherry Munyon with the Minnesota Public Transit Association. This organization, as you may be aware, uh, represents all of the bus providers across the state of Minnesota. And we uh, thank you for the funding bill before us today. We definitely support the metropolitan area transit funding needs and the recognition of suburban transit systems sharing in any new revenue for the communities and citizens they represent. We've always supported a multimodal transportation bill and continue to do so, particularly understanding that our buses and passengers need safe roads and bridges as well. However, I must state our concern today that Greater Minnesota Transit operators saw a change in the bill which takes them out of the increased growth of lease vehicle revenue which would be coming from the general fund. We are concerned that in the future this would put us in a situation where transit operators would see their funding negotiable every two years by having a higher share of revenue come from the general fund rather than a dedicated funding source. The history on the inclusion of Greater Minnesota Transit Systems in the lease vehicle revenue goes back to the 2008 bill. One of the things that had been under discussion was how to find a stable, ongoing, dedicated source of revenue for Greater Minnesota to grow their systems and serve those populations. In addition to that, there was a last minute change in the funding bill which took some of the general fund money that had been set aside for bus operators in Greater Minnesota and used it for the uh, commuter rail system, North Star rail system. So in the final negotiations, we did become a part of the lease vehicle revenue, and we have seen major accomplishments begun in greater Minnesota due to that revenue. Serving counties in 80, 80 counties in Minnesota, serving hundreds of cities, and serving major systems across the state, the onboard surveys that were done show that 33% of our riders are using the bus for work trips. 20% are going to school. This is not a social service anymore. This is a significant impact to citizens in greater Minnesota. With that, I have uh, provided three handouts, and I give my apologies to Senator Westrom. I did not provide digital copies to the committee administrator, and I will do so after the hearing. 
The first item that you have is a map of Greater Minnesota Transit System. And as you can see and have heard before, we do not have substantive service throughout Greater Minnesota. And there's barely any evening or weekend service in Greater Minnesota. We're still looking forward to rectifying that. The second map that you have in front of you shows the service hours in Greater Minnesota. And you will see, <coughs> excuse me, that there has been a growth in service hours out state. And this has particularly uh, increased since 2008 when lease vehicle revenues came into play. The last handout that you have is the Minnesota ridership numbers. And because of the ability to increase service, you'll see that folks have been very interested in using the service that's been provided. I know time is running short, but I just uh, there are want five to, minutes left with five more testifiers. I just want to state again that we're asking for your support, trying to meet the statutory goals of 80% by 2015. We're only at 63% today and 90% by 2025. We need your assistance for a dedicated source. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Senator Westrom, Senator, and then Senator Sengem. We won't use this, count this against your time. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just. Uh, to the gentleman from St. Cloud, we were talking about the bus fares for college students. Can you tell me what are those fares? Are they free or are they reduced, I assume, uh, in some sort? Yeah, with the subsidies, the students ride for free. Okay. Chair, so what is, what is the normal Senator fee, Western. Mr. Chair? Uh, what would what would the average rider pay? Yeah, the public fare in St. Cloud is $1.25. Okay. All right. <laughs> Senator Sanders. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to follow up, same sort of question is is that true of any of any Minsky facility with bus view, uh, service in Minnesota you know be it I don't know Mankato Rochester mr. Cook pick, pick your city st. cloud yeah, oh, you're, you're sure, sure remember uh, uh, um, several several of our uh, uh, Minsky schools do have similar arrangements as we do in st. cloud where the students are able to ride their systems for free the the um, subsidy for the students to do that is shared between the University's administration and the students' fees themselves, uh, and then we also uh, provide some additional subsidy to allow that to occur. Uh, and that's how that that uh, arrangement works, at least in Saint Cloud. And, and Mr. Chair, that's by virtue of money in the transportation bill that you are able to provide that your portion of the subsidy, Mr. Cookshank. Yeah. Well, um, if we if we lose the subsidy from the university, we'd have to start charging the students. Our fear is that the uh, ridership is going to decrease significantly. And uh, uh, we want to restore that subsidy. So with, with some help, uh, we could keep that subsidy restored and, and allow that program to continue as it has for the last 10 years very successfully. Thank you. All right, Senator Reiner. Okay. All right, never mind. All right. Um, members uh, or uh, uh, testifiers, we have one, two, three, four testifiers in four minutes and 30 seconds left. Mr. Workey. Mr. Chairman, committee members, uh, good morning. My name is Tim Workey. I represent the Associated General Contractors of Minnesota. We're the state's oldest and largest construction trade association. I'm here on behalf of my contractor members. want to thank the chairman for this uh, uh, approach in this bill. Um, we do believe that a long-term stable funding approach as represented in this bill is the best approach. You've heard a lot of discussions this session about efficiency. With respect to the approach in this bill, I would argue that it is the most efficient expenditure of money to have a long-term approach versus a short-term, one-time approach. That is because in the market, contractors uh, are looking for opportunities long-term. It allows them to business plan and make strategic equipment or make strategic decisions like purchasing equipment and materials on hand and other economies of scale that would be brought to bear in their bid pricing. The short-term approach, I think, is inefficient in that it does not yield those opportunities. Contractors would be putting contingencies in their bids in order to uh, protect themselves and additional profit in measures of, of that nature. Additionally, uh, I have a handout coming around. I, I would like to highlight that it's a good time to invest in, the, uh, in transportation at this point in time in the marketplace. Um, you, as everyone around the table, appreciates the input pricing right now for uh, materials like uh, oil, uh, fuel, steel, and other construction inputs are stable and or falling. 
it's a competitive market out there right now. Uh, we're getting good pricing, uh, and that would be reflected to the state uh, in bids. One of the questions that I think is inevitable is if this bill were to pass, is the industry capable of delivering? My answer to you is yes, absolutely. Uh, we survey our members every year. I uh, have copies of that survey. I did not pass it out. It's very voluminous. We survey our members year over year and ask things like if additional market opportunity became available, would you be able to participate? The overwhelming answer to that question from our members is yes. A number of my members have reached out to us recently and have told me that even this year they, they are only seeing 30 to 50 percent of their normal capacity. So there is capacity in the marketplace to do more. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, there is a handout going around. Two minutes um, left for the rest of the testimony, Mr. Workey. Um, I just want to say the P3 provisions in the bill are a concern to us. We believe that they are not fully developed yet, and I've passed around a white paper that our association has put together with public-private partnerships, and we'd encourage you to move cautiously in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. <laughs> Chair, uh, Chair Dibble and members of the committee, my name is Russell Hess and I work for the Labor's District Council of Minnesota and North Dakota. Uh, enough about me, I want to tell you a story about a laborer uh, that actually exists in the real world. I had two stories, only going to tell you one. Um, this year at our lobby day, I met a laborer who had been working as a nurse's aide at a n local nursing home since high school. She had a job making $9 an hour and as she said in her words, she was going nowhere. She had contemplated training to be an RN but when she saw what it cost, knew that she didn't want to go that far in debt. So she answered an ad for a construction job in the newspaper. And as she said, it changed her life. She's an apprentice with the laborers now. She makes twice as much in wages and for the first time in her life has health insurance and a retirement plan. She's, co she's completed half of her classroom training hours and needs only get in two more seasons of work to be a journey worker. While she traded one back-breaking job with crappy hours for another back-breaking job with crappy hours, as a laborer, she sees a path to creating a better life for herself and family and the ability to retire with dignity someday. For her, this legislation is about us making investments in our transportation system so that she can be certain that there will be projects for her to work on for years to come. Thank you for the opportunity to share that story. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hess. Uh, Senator Westrom. Well, Mr. Chair, I know you're trying to keep it on a time constraint. Uh, just, just as one committee member, uh, if, if adding three or five minutes to this side and then the other side is... Uh, uh, doable, I, I think that would be uh, sure. fine with me, and I just uh, let you know that uh, as a committee. Right, we'll take uh, we'll take uh, ten minutes away from our deliberation. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I, I think we're going to have to do that because we have a couple more people that we really do want to hear from sure. on sure. the proponent side. So, Mr. Dibble, can I tell my other story then? Uh, <laughs> no. It's a good one. No. <laughs> it's, it's your coalition. Uh, right. yeah. It'll be quick. All right. Uh, the second story is about a guy from a small town in southern Minnesota who worked as a laborer for 10 years, always thinking he wanted to have his own company someday. He saved his money and eventually was able to borrow money from friends and family to start a company. He started out fixing and pouring sidewalks and gradually built his company until today is one of the most successful curb and gutter sump contractors in southern Minnesota. He credits his success in part to having a job that allowed him to save some money to invest in himself but in order to keep his business thriving, needs us to invest in fixing our infrastructure. For him, this bill is about creating jobs for other laborers and helping folks achieve the American dream. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hess. We have uh, Dorian Grilly and Peter McLaughlin. Welcome. Morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dorian Grilly. I work for the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. But today I'm here representing active transportation advocates statewide. We want to thank you for including language in Senate File 87 that creates and funds a Greater Minnesota and Metro Area Active Transportation Program. You, you and leaders from the, out the, throughout the state have recognized that there is a great need. Demand for the federally funded transportation enhanced uh, alternatives and safe routes to school programs greatly exceeds the funds available and the demand for these funds keeps increasing. Uh, leaders from throughout the state know that a walkable and bikeable community is an asset that will help it attract and retain residents, families, uh, and businesses that will keep their communities strong. And I had lots of stories too, but I will skip over to uh, the end. Um, I think making it safe and convenient for people to walk and bike 
is a fabulous and incredibly cost-effective investment uh, that will help us address some of our society's most complex problems. I don't think I need to tell you what those problems are. I think it's really about quality of life in our communities and as uh, for us as individuals. And finally, I think it's worth noting that when asked on his final interview on the PBS NewsHour, what was most important in 36 years in Congress, Jim Overstar said safe routes to school. Excellent. Okay. Welcome, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. I'm Peter McLaughlin. I'm a Hennepin County Commissioner, Chair of the County's Transit Improvement Board. I'm joined by Nancy Schuweiler, who's also a member of the uh, CTIP Board and, and a Dakota County Commissioner. Uh, we uh, very much support the additional sales tax for the build out of the, of the transit system in the metropolitan area, including the expansion of the bus system and, and uh, as well the funding for transit and transportation purposes for counties. We believe that uh, these investments are the cornerstone for uh, economic, one of the cornerstones for economic prosperity in the state of Minnesota as we, as we move forward. Our vision for this regional system of transportation is to get it built uh, faster and more efficiently. We believe that this bill does that. We have, uh, we have a history of lagging behind uh, in recent years, and we think that this bill corrects that and we're very supportive of it. There are uh, a couple of minor adjustments to the bill that uh, you're aware of, Mr. Chairman, and there are amendments to uh, change it, the allocation of the funding so that we are able to pick up the state's 10% share, get that out of the out of the state bonding bill, we would be able to pick that up with the with the uh, with the new sales tax in the metropolitan area. So that's going to be a benefit for the whole state. We're not going to be seeking bonding money for these big projects in the future. Uh, we're going to be using a sales tax in the metropolitan area to fund that additional 10% share. And I would remind everyone that the goal here is to get the federal government to match this. And they have, they have contributed, uh, since CTIB was created, almost $750 million and a billion and a half dollars since, uh, since we first began making investments in, in transit. We think that makes the pie bigger and makes our transportation system better. We appreciate very much the eighth of a cent of the net proceeds of the sales tax to county transportation uh, purposes, transit and transportation purposes. Uh, that's going to reduce property tax contributions to these to these projects and provide for an ability to move forward faster. We think that's important, to move faster on these investments. It's been a fundamental building block of Minnesota's prosperity since after the Second World War, investment in infrastructure. We think this bill does it. Uh, Underinvesting in transportation is, a, is a, a big mistake and we pay a price for it. This bill gets us moving forward again here in the 21st century to invest in transportation that we need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right, that puts us right at, we'll call it uh, 40 minutes. So I actually did pretty well, that's pretty great. Um, and uh, we'll start with uh, Bentley Graves, uh, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Again, Bentley Graves, from the, I'm the Director of Healthcare and Transportation Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And as many of you know, the chamber represents 2,300 businesses statewide with roughly half in the metro area and the other half located in greater Minnesota. We represent businesses of all sizes based in Minnesota, from Fortune 500 corporations to sole proprietors. And over 80% of our membership is small and mid-sized companies with 100 employees or less. The business community has a strong interest in the development of a preservation of a reliable, multimodal transportation system in Minnesota. Without it, businesses cannot get their goods to market, their employees to work, or their customers to their doors. The Minnesota Chamber supports additional investment at a level to maintain the existing transportation system, roads, bridges, and transit, and provide for strategic enhancements to it so our infrastructure addresses demographic, economic, and technological trends. To do this, we believe the legislature should pass a long-term <coughs> funding plan that provides additional investment to our transportation system through the efficient use of current resources, general fund appropriations, and value capture uh, user fee mechanisms. The 2012 Transportation Finance Advisory Committee recommended that roughly 15% of the state's long-term funding needs for transportation be met through a focus on using resources more efficiently. This is a reasonable and responsible target for the Department of Transportation and the Metropolitan Council to meet. We must also broaden the base of the financial support for our transportation infrastructure. Fuel taxes, vehicle registration fees, and motor vehicle sales taxes are not sufficient in the long term to support the growing demand for increased investment. 33 states use money from the general fund to, su to supplement financing for state roads and bridges. Minnesota does not. 
We believe that any funding package that provides additional investment into our transportation system should rely on meaningful general fund support. This can and should be done in an ongoing and substantive way. Finally, where it's appropriate to do so, we uh, value capture mechanisms should be used to match a portion of a project's cost with those who most directly benefit from it. Many cities and states around the country have successfully used value capture to help fund transit projects in particular. And studies completed by both the Center for Transportation Studies and the University of Minnesota uh, and MnDOT have indicated that value capture can be used as a meaningful funding mechanism for certain projects. We appreciate the steps that Senate File 87 takes to highlight value capture as a potential funding mechanism through its public-private partnership pilot program. We also appreciate the emphasis that Article 7 of the bill places on increased efficiency in the transportation planning and program delivery. Though we believe the bill should go further and hold our transportation agencies to the 15% efficiency mark that TFAC recommended and that the Commissioner of Transportation has committed the department to, we hope that the increased reporting requirement in Section 12 of Article 7 will help move the direct department in that direction. The Minnesota Chamber is opposed to Senate File 87, however, because it, because it answers the larger question of how to get increased investment into our transportation system through significant new tax increases. At a time when our state is enjoying record budget surpluses on the heels of record tax increases in recent years, we believe now is the time to think differently about how we fund transportation and to consider the practice of many other states which use the general fund to ensure the viability and competitiveness of their transportation system. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my name is Mark Ogren. I own Croyle Company. We're based in Stillwater. We're a family business. We've been in the petroleum industry for 51 years. I'm not here to comment on whether there should be more money spent on roads and bridges. I am here, however, to say that the mechanism that's being discussed is wrong and the size of it is absolutely absurd. The proposed 6.5% gross receipts tax would add a whopping 18 cents a gallon to the cost of fuel. There's already a mechanism in place to collect money for this, and that's through the collection of the fuel excise tax. We all know that the only reason this is being proposed this way is an attempt to hide it from the taxpayers. So those proposing it can say, this was a cost passed on by the wholesaler. When this was initially discussed last year, someone at the legislative level made the comment that it would be up to the wholesaler to pass it on if they so chose. Really? Our average markup is a penny and a half a gallon. The proposed tax is 12 times what our markup is. This is not some secret pot of money that was just discovered. So you have a penny and a half per gallon markup and an 18 cent per gallon tax. I can assure you this would be passed on to the retailers and then on to the consumers as a tax. If you use a funding mechanism such as this, how do you go about budgeting for projects when you have no idea how much money is going to be raised from year to year? What kind of forward planning is that? Furthermore, why would you have a funding mechanism in place that actually collects more money when the price of fuel is at its highest? What's the rationale for that? Collect more money from the consumer when they are hurting the most? Additionally, there's not a ceiling in place that would limit the amount raised, just a floor that would ensure a minimum amount is collected. So you have this 18 cent per gallon tax gimmick, which will be added to the 28 and a half cent current state excise tax and 18.4 federal excise tax for a total of 64.9 cents per gallon. An average fill up is 12 gallons. That's over $7.50 in taxes alone per fill up. If this is implemented as proposed, the disparity in taxes between Minnesota and our neighboring states would be devastating and would cripple the businesses of every convenience store gas station in the areas around the borders. Minnesotans deserve transparency in the taxes they, transparency in the taxes they pay. If you think it's necessary to spend more money on roads and bridges, then at least have the courage to go about it in the right way and call it what it is, an 18 cent per gallon tax. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Appitz. Mr. Wagner, welcome. Thank you, uh, ch Chair and Committee. Uh, Mark Wagner, President, Twin City and Western Railroad. And what I'm going to talk about is specific to our railroad, but my story can be applied to the uh, other 17 short lines in Minnesota. 
Um, speaking specifically about Article 6 of Senate File 87, the railroad property tax uh, increase. Um, let me tell you a little story. A shoreline railroads, um, we provide a service of growing the economies of the areas we serve. Um, we're a transportation corridor, so it's always been a challenge to how to value that. Um, if we have a good year, we're worth a lot. If we have a bad year, we're not worth much, much at all. And um, what troubles me about this is that this will embed a permanent increase uh, in perpetuity. And when the short line railroads were spun off back in the late 80s, early 90s, they were spun off because we were marginal operations. We're marginal because we don't have a lot of car loads relative to the miles that we operate. Hence, uh, the majority of our dollars go back into putting into our track. And so by taking this money away from us, uh, will actually render our future uh, challenging because that's money we otherwise would reinvest in our track. And so having this increase um, is, is very, very troubling. I looked at the governor's list of all the cities and townships and the ones along our rail line, when you combine the counties, the cities, and the uh, townships, it was about $280,000 a year, forever. Now, that's about half of the cost of one track machine. We have to buy a new track machine, or a used one, about every 10 years. Um, we, we have jointed rail that needs to be fixed over the long haul. That's about a $20 million project. We just don't generate that kind of revenue to uh, be able to reinvest that. It's going to take a lot of time. So $280,000 might not sound like a lot, but it is a lot to us. Um, the public benefits that we provide, we keep uh, tr one rail car equals anywhere between three and four trucks. Those are trucks that are not on Twin City roads, not on Minnesota roads, but they're on rails that are, we're maintaining. So we're saving the taxpayer wear and tear on the roads. Um, the roads going through the towns do not pay property taxes, yet the railroad that does go through town does. Um, I've been with the railroad since 1991, starting out as their accountant, and so doing the property taxes has been something I'm very familiar with. And I always thought that the way it was done was fair. It does take into account over a five-year period um, how well we've done. And I think it works very well. The Department of Revenue says that it's obsolete. I look at the study they cited, and the study is full of opinions and not a lot of facts. And so I think we need to go back, the railroads do, to Department of Revenue and say, we need to clear this up. So I think having this in this bill is the wrong time, and I think it will cause permanent damage to the 17 short lines that operate in Minnesota. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Appitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is John Appitz. I work with uh, Mr. Wagner. I represent the Minnesota Regional Railroads Association up here. But I'm going to speak just uh, very briefly on behalf of most of the railroads, all the railroads that operate in Minnesota. And Minnesota's railroads do appreciate what you, Senator Dibble, and the others have been doing to craft the transportation measure that uh, attempts to address the state's needs for investment in highways, roads, bridges, and in transit systems as well. Uh, Minnesota's railroads are making similar private investments in the track, rolling stock, and facilities of the freight transportation system that connects this state with the rest of the nation. Nationally, railroads will be investing more than $26 billion in infrastructure improvements, and as part of that effort in Minnesota, Class 1 railroads will be operate, who operate in Minnesota will be investing over $500 million in the infrastructure system of this state, of this state in, 19, in 2015 alone. Clearly, we both have a lot of work to do, and Minnesota's railroads are committed to keeping Minnesota's economy moving. However, the railroad industry strongly opposes what uh, Mr. Uh, Wagner has referenced, Article 6 of this bill, which deals with railroad property taxes. Article 6 would include personal property, bridges, trestles, rolling stock, with the real property of railroads that Minnesota now taxes. And in doing so, it treats, re, uh, re, excuse me, it treats railroad personal property different from other commercial industrial property in the state. And in doing so, it violates federal law. We had this discussion in the tax committee, and we had about two hours worth of conversation about this, so you get the three-minute version. But Article 6 violates the Federal Railroad Revitalization and Regulatory Reform Act. We call it the 4R Act. 
The 4R Act requires railroads be treated no worse than any other commercial industrial taxpayers in the state. It was passed in the 1970s to protect railroads from the very sort of discriminatory taxation that Article 6 would propose. This isn't new, obviously, and it's been litigated here in Minnesota. Federal courts have recognized in Minnesota that there is no doubt that railroad personal property must be exempted from taxation given Minnesota's exemption for other commercial industrial taxpayer personal property. And you can look at Burlington Northern versus James, 1983 case. In fact, the Department of Revenue actually agrees with the railroads and stipulated to that result in that case. The judge said, under Minnesota law, virtually all personal property, including commercial and industrial pers personal property, has been exempted from ad, ad valorem taxation. For the purposes of this action, the parties agree that Section 306 requires personal property of railroads, such as BN, to be exempt from taxation. Article 6 of this bill would have the legislature do what the department itself said was illegal. I'd like to say some more about the rule uh, proposed provisions in this bill. I won't go into that right now. What I did find rather interesting, though, was that when um, this idea was originally put forward by the governor, he encouraged towns and counties to get on board because he proposed it as a way of reducing the homestead and homeowner property taxes in those jurisdictions. This is a transportation funding bill. Homeowner property taxes should be dealt with in other areas, not under the guise of taxing railroads. And so for these reasons, we'd ask that Article 6 be removed from the bill. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Rapids. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, I am not Peter Nelson, and I don't play him on TV. Um, but he is here. I am Fritz Kanak. And I am here representing uh, the Center for the American Experiment as co-author of their policy uh, study that they did. Uh, some of the ideas, in fact, that I think we advanced in that policy study you are now hearing uh, in the debate because we viewed this, the transportation funding issue, as quite probably the most important one that the legislature is going to uh, face not only this year, but uh, well into two or three more session cycles. We applaud the committee and we applaud uh, chairman, uh, chairman for having uh, taken the initiative in going forward and recognizing the extent of the problem. Uh, we do believe that this problem is, in fact, uh, as serious as has been represented by the Department of Commerce, by the Department, rather, of uh, Transportation. But uh, we also would encourage the committee to consider, as part of our recommendation, the suggestion that the legislative auditor be engaged to check and ascertain as to ultimately what those figures are, given the size and importance overall this has to the budget. Uh, having started, though, on that positive note, I must also say we don't agree that the method being used to raise funds uh, for this bill is appropriate. We think that a sales tax, uh, or a rather a gas tax increase or a fuel tax increase is inherently regressive. And uh, in addition to that, it ultimately it won't be sustainable. You're dealing with a, an issue where, as you know and as you've heard, uh, the actual fuel use is going down. The fuel prices are likely to stay depressed, thank God, uh, but not so much from the state's point of view. A better way of sustained support for this enormous expense must be found. We agree, though, that some kind of sustained way of paying for transportation should be found. Our recommendation initially at least is to dedicate uh, uh, 0.25 percentage uh, points, which is about a four quarter cent of uh, the sales tax or tax on uh, each dollar, uh, toward transportation funding. These are funds that are currently available uh, for other uses. They are general funds. Nevertheless, we would suggest that you, rec that you actually dedicate and start the process of disciplining yourselves to dedicate general fund revenues for that purpose. That ultimately is what it is going to sustain transportation funding. Uh, I would also, I'm mindful of the fact that uh, in my time, I would encourage you to read this uh, uh, blueprint uh, where we have laid out uh, some additional thoughts on this particular topic. I'll leave you with this. 
Uh, when we did this, of course, the proposal for the very large metro-wide property <coughs> tax, or metro-wide uh, sales tax, rather, uh, to sustain transit had not yet been proposed. I can assure you that, that we would not support that. We believe that it is unnecessary, even though I understand it has been a policy goal of uh, trans transit, ex uh, transit supporters for decades. Uh, we don't believe that the current tax environment would justify it. In Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knock. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lance Klatt, Executive Director of the Minnesota Service Station Community Service Association. I'm here on behalf of Doug Milky, or Dean Milky, pardon me, and the other 400 retail members we support in the petroleum, repair, and community store industries. In the past few years, our industry has seen legislation impact their daily operations, their sales, their profitability, and their personal lives. Two years ago, a normal cigarette tax increase of $1.60 per pack on cigarettes has affected many of my retail members and constituents within your districts. My retail members currently operating stores next to the neighboring uh, borders of the states have had a mighty struggle staying in business after the sales they have lost due to the last cigarette tax increase. Not only did these uh, they lose sales and profits from the cigarette and tobacco categories, they lost sales in gasoline, additional merchandise sales, but more importantly, many jobs within their communities. The gross receipts tax included in Senate File 87 will not only cost our consumers more money, it will also cost our retailers lost sales within miles of bordering states. One item most of us do not talk about, that is the interchange fees of the credit and debit card fees. With an increase of 18 cents tax per gallon on today's number, the average retailer spent just over $1,400 more a year on credit and debit card fees just for collecting our government's tax. As gas prices increase, 6.5% will only increase our cost of doing business, since a 6.5% is a percentage and not a fixed number. Today we understand that we do have an opportunity to fix our roadways, maintain our roadways, but we just ask that you consider, uh, uh, reconsider uh, the 6.5% gross receipts tax um, as this will uh, continue to decrease, we feel, the sales, profits, and jobs for local retailers within miles of the Minnesota's borders. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Klatt. We have Klatt and Knock. Klatt. Former Senator Fritz Knock, too. Well, all right, uh, Mr. Osnes. Ms. Backus. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I know time is short, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to make a few comments today. My name is Perry Osnes. I serve as Executive Director with the Minnesota Agri Growth Council. By way of background, Agri Growth's membership represents the broad section of what is Minnesota's ag and food sector, including agribusinesses, production agriculture, processors, food manufacturers, and numerous other businesses involved in supporting the ag sector. And certainly, as you all know, uh, Minnesota's ag sector relies on a robust transportation network of roads as well as rail and waterways to deliver products to local, national, and global markets. And our members certainly recognize the critical need for Minnesota to, con to continue to make important investments that both maintain and improve the capacity and the efficiency of our transportation system. And I also want to just acknowledge that uh, the challenge that you have, Mr. Chair, and the committee and the legislature has in trying to craft a transportation funding package that uh, balances the multiple competing interests that you've already heard today. That said, I, I do want to uh, uh, indicate that agri-growth is opposed to the gross receipts tax as been presented in the bill. The reasons for opposition is the level of increase. Uh, it's a significant increase in the fact that there's not a cap on the, on the tax as well and certainly becomes uh, uh, more regressive as the cost of gas goes up. That said, we are open and supported looking at multitude of options to help address critical transportation needs, including the, uh, the general fund uh, surplus has been referenced already, bonding for roads and bridges, as well as looking at those efficiencies within MnDOT before considering any type of additional gas tax increase. Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Osnes. Ms. Bacchus. Mr. Chair and members, my name is Amber Bacchus and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Auto Dealers Association and its 358 franchise new car and truck dealers located around the state. We're happy to report that 2015 was a banner year for motor vehicle sales in Minnesota and expect to exceed the $10.2 billion in total sales our members reached in 2013. This is great news for the state as well. For when our members sell more cars and trucks, the state collects more in MVEST proceeds to fund Minnesota's roads, bridges and transit. With the state's transportation revenue so closely linked to the success of our industry, we'd hate to see policies enacted that discourage sales of new cars and trucks. 
Unfortunately, we are afraid that the tab fee increase included in Senate File 87 could have that effect. Already, the taxes and fees collected on the sale of new cars and trucks in Minnesota are higher than any of our surrounding states. And the state of Minnesota even makes more off the sale of new vehicles than our dealers do. As the price of new vehicles increases over time, there is already an inflationary factor built into the current registration fees and MVEST, as Commissioner Zelli pointed out yesterday. Increasing the base rate of registration taxes by a quarter percent, as Senate File 87 does, makes the price of a new motor vehicle more expensive and could discourage its sale. As a matter of public policy, wouldn't we rather encourage consumers to purchase safer and cleaner vehicles that come with a higher price tag and generate more MVEST versus raising taxes in a way that could discourage those sales? We would recommend keeping the registration tax at 1.25% on the sale of new vehicles. We are also pleased to see the omission of street improvement free fees from Senator Dibble's delete all amendment. However, we are not as enthused with the replacement mechanism designed to provide revenue to Minnesota's municipalities, a new surcharge on motor vehicle transfer fees. Again, this would increase the selling price of new cars and trucks. While instituted at a minimal amount now, these fees have a tendency to grow over time and be used to satisfy other budgetary needs. Case in point. The motor vehicle transfer fee, to which the city surcharge is being added, started as a $4 temporary fee to fund waste tire cleanup. Since then, the fee has increased by 150% and has been used over the years to fund everything from environmental cleanup to debt service on revenue bonds to plugging holes in the state budget. As a result, we are leery of adding this new surcharge to motor vehicle transfers and creating the potential for a kitchen sink general fund revenue, general fund subsidized by our customers. I do appreciate the opportunity to testify and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Backus. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Steve Rush. I'm the Director of Government Relations for Holiday Companies, a Bloomington-based family-owned convenience store company doing business in Minnesota for about 90 years. I'm also a member of the Minnesota Retail Board of Directors of the Minnesota Retailers Association. Currently, a gasoline retailer like Holiday collects almost 50 cents in taxes on a gallon of gas sold in Minnesota as the average fill is 12 gallons every time a consumer fills their tank they're essentially paying a six dollar transportation fee that's a lot of money gas taxes are extremely regressive most of us are able to fill up our gas tanks without really worrying about whether we're able to pay for it but we have many folks who come to our stores who can't afford to fill their tanks and they come in and give us a 20 a 10 and even a five dollar bill a 6.5% gross receipts tax would add 18 cents per gallon of gas or a 63% increase in the current excise tax of 28.6 cents. Combined with a federal tax of 18.4 cents, a consumer would pay a total of $7.80 in taxes or transportation fee every time they fill up. Looking at this another way, if we add 18 cents to the current gas tax, a consumer would pay 46.6 cents per gallon in state taxes alone. When I was driving in here, I noticed the posted price to average about $2.40 a gallon. A 46.6 cents state tax is about a 20% tax on a gallon of gas. That is almost three times our state sales tax of 6.875. If you add the federal tax, we are forcing a consumer to pay 65 cents per gallon or an effective tax rate of 27%. We do need a safe and reliable transportation system and devoting more resources are likely warranted. I know you have a hard job to do. However, we should look at existing available resources to fund the more pressing needs that MnDOT is able to identify. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rush. Mr. Estenson, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name uh, is Jeremy Estenson. I work for the law firm of Stinson Leonard Street, and I'm here representing the Minnesota Trucking Association. Uh, Mr. Chair, the Trucking Association's uh, uh, broad transportation position is similar to that of the testimony um, uh, Mr. Graves gave, but a few specific items to trucking. Uh, first on the gross receipts tax, uh, trucks operate, um, for the most part, in <coughs> lots of jurisdictions. Many of them have different tax structures. The average truck domiciled in Minnesota pays $15,500 per year. Um, from a philosophical standpoint, we dislike things that complicate that patchwork of jurisdictions and taxing mechanisms. Uh, and from a technical standpoint, we would be concerned that this uh, structure work well with the International Fuel Tax Agreement. Briefly, that is uh, where a truck might operate in different states or different taxing jurisdictions. Each state 
uh, gets an amount remitted back for the miles that the truck drove in it rather than what it might have paid at the pump. Imagine driving through, for instance, the state of Minnesota or Iowa and not filling up. Uh, those states are compensated for the, for the use in those roads. Um, the second concern we have is specific to tolling. And uh, we aren't here to uh, um, speak specifically about the P3 um, uh, pilot project as a whole, but in Article 9 section, or Article 8, excuse me, Section 19, uh, on line 60.5, there is a um, language that would exempt um, the P3 pilot project from uh, work that the Trucking Association did in 2008 uh, with many of you to create a statutory prohibition uh, on tolling for existing infrastructure. Now our concern isn't that um, that a investor might get together with a, a unit of government and build some new thing, some new bridge, road, whatever. Our concern is more like what uh, the, Chicago, uh, the examples we use are Chicago Skyway, uh, the Indiana Toll Road, where uh, big pieces of infrastructure that already exist and were paid for by taxpayers already are then leased off for long periods of time uh, and then maintained, operated, and tolled uh, by, by private investors. We, we know that uh, beyond underperforming um, uh, those two projects in particular, uh, that there are high administrative costs, uh, higher than 25% generally, as opposed to the fuel tax, which costs about 2% to administer. Uh, there are safety issues created around diversion as drivers seek to uh, avoid paying the tolls and so forth. Uh, but Mr. Chair, our, our concerns haven't changed since 2008, and if anything, our opposition to tolling existing infrastructure has probably grown. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you, committee members, for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Essenson. Senator Osmick. Thank you. One question for the truckers. Um, obviously, when we go to the pump, residential or just average citizens are going to be paying more. Truckers are also going to be paying more. What's going? If the truckers are going to be paying this additional tax, what's going to happen to uh, trucking and delivery costs? What do you anticipate? Mr. Estenson. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Osmick, um, it's, the answer is maybe more complicated than you think, but costs are going to go up simply. Um, our customers uh, understand fuel taxes, and they understand sometimes a fuel tax surcharge. We're uncertain how customers might react to this particular mechanism, um, but uh, the simple answer is that the costs will go up. Mr. Chair. Senator Osmick. So just to follow up, so we will be taxed at the pump when we fill Will we, be ta we will also be passing on a tax on retail into our pocketbook. So this is the tax that keeps on taxing. Is that somewhat one way to put it? Uh, Sen Senator Osmick, are you asking if there's a, a double tax? <coughs> this tax is collected at one time in one place. No, Mr. Chair, what I'm saying is, is that by increasing the tax upon the people who deliver the truckers, they're going to have to pass that tax on to us as increased delivery charges, increased prices, which will uh, result, and I know we have the grocers coming up relatively soon. That's going to also impact us when we pay when we go to the grocery store and have to pay more for any goods and services that our friends with the trucking industry provide to us. I'm just trying to get on the record that that is a very, very likely possibility. Great, thanks. I appreciate it. Mr. Nothing All further, right. Mr. All right. Thank you. Um, thank. Welcome to. It's full. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jamie Poole, and I'm president of the Minnesota Grocers Association. We are a state trade association who has represented the food industry of Minnesota since 1897. We have over 200 retail members with nearly 1,100 stores statewide and approximately 100 wholesale and manufacturer partners. Our members and uh, companies employ over 125,000 union and non-union Minnesotans. We are the backbone of Minnesota's economy, providing one out of 20 jobs in the state. We are blessed in the state of Minnesota to have hundreds of small, independent, and locally grown owned uh, uh, grocery and convenience stores. Again, we are the cornerstones of our community. Senate File 87 includes billions of dollars of tax and fee increases, which we are deeply concerned about with the overreach of these recommendations and the overall impact that this is going to have on Minnesota's basket size. Let me provide a little insight into our industry. The average sale per customer transaction is around $31. Our average customer stops in 1.6 times a week. The average family of four spends a weekly shopping basket of about $128. 
the retail food industry itself typically operates on a net profit margin of around 1%. The recommendations that you've heard today um, will take real dollars out of each Minnesotan's pocketbook in higher license tabs, added fees, and higher prices at the pumps. We know from industry studies that gas prices pay a significant role in how consumers feel about the economy, and there is a direct correlation to their spending habits. Additionally, as you've heard from prior testimony, the gas in increases will trickle down the supply, excuse me, supply chain increasing cost of transport goods, creating higher food and general merchandise products, and creating further burdens on Minnesota families. As an industry, we care deeply about our transportation needs. A robust transportation infrastructure allows products and consumers to get to marketplace, creates jobs and economic growth. We believe in funding efficiencies and using infrastructure that the state currently has. We recognize your challenges that you face during this session with the budget surplus. There will be many difficult decisions to create a balanced budget that is fis fiscally and socially responsible. Like you, we face these questions as an industry about managing our bottom line. As you move, move forward, please consider the ramifications to the entire food supply chain of Minnesota. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. Welcome to the committee. Good, good morning, Chair Double and committee members. I'm Deb McMillan. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Twin West Chamber of Commerce. Twin West represents more than 700 member businesses in the western suburbs of the Twin Cities. And I'm here today to testify in opposition on Senate File 87. Members of the Twin West Chamber of Commerce support a 10-year plan that focuses first on maintaining our system and on the strategic investments to reduce congestion and bottlenecks. Transit should be focused in the most effective way to move people to job corridors. We agree that Minnesota's transportation system needs additional investment. As businesses adjust to the new recent tax increases, employer mandates, and higher health care costs, they have little appetite for increasing the sales tax or gas tax, and even less for the proposed 6.5% wholesale fuel tax. However, members have long supported seeking efficiencies within the $2.5 billion that is already collected annually for transportation. These efficiencies should be real, transparent, and generate an additional 15% investment in transportation projects. Our members also recognize that transportation is a basic and primary function of government and want to see it prioritized as such. Therefore, we support a larger allocation from the general fund, and this idea is not novel. 33 other states already dedicate a portion of their general fund for this very purpose. And finally, we support a robust exploration of new user fee models that share costs among those that realize benefit. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Hughes. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Matt Hughes and I'm with Cooperative Network. Thank you for allowing me to testify today in opposition of Senate File 87 and thank you for your efforts on this issue. Cooperative Network is a two-state trade association of not-for-profit, member-owned cooperative businesses of various kinds in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Minnesota is the number one cooperative state in the nation with more than 1,000 cooperative businesses headquartered here. These cooperative businesses, in turn, are owned by more than 3.4 million residents of our state. Cooperative Network's broad membership includes a number of local Minnesota cooperatives in the fuel business. While Cooperative Network is not opposed to a sound investment in our transportation system, we strongly oppose any legislation creating a gross receipts tax on motor fuels. Cooperatives are not-for-profit entities and operate as close as prudently possible to a zero net margin. Cooperatives return their net revenues in a different setting, these would be profits, back to their member owners in the form of payments proportional to their patronage of the cooperative. Much of, much of that patronage finds its way back into the local economy, fueling the kind of consumer spending and reinvestment that's so badly needed in greater Minnesota. The 6.5% wholesale gross receipts tax proposal would be in addition to state and federal excise taxes. Recent estimates suggest it would mean roughly 18 cents additional at the pump, catapulting us above surrounding states. First, we have concerns about rural and border competition. We are concerned that Minnesota remain competitive. This proposal increases the cost of doing business and creates competitive disadvantage, especially for rural border communities. And with cooperatives, this proposal directly impacts member owners. They are the business. Next, we have concerns about the public transparency and administrative burden. Many are touting how positive it will be that MnDOT won't have to come back for a long time. But when taxes are raised, people expect decision. As a matter of fact, they count on it. Coming back to debate this at the legislature relatively often protects consumers and taxpayers and protects our messy but time-tested system. 
Given the potential confusion and complexity, we are not convinced this mechanism assures no administrative burden, and we question the level of transparency with the public. Many are referring to this as 6.5 percent, but a very important number to keep on our minds is roughly 18 cents increase at this stage. Finally, while we have concerns about no funding cap and less flexibility, I'm not, a, I'm not aware of the cap on the proposal, so this means very high cost for consumers and profound increased revenue for MnDOT. If this type of funding is passed, it will be very difficult to adjust back down. If we ever want to make other transitions and or reforms in how we fund transportation, that is unlikely to happen for a long time if this funding level is approved. At first glance, the gross receipts tax appears to like an easy solution to help champion the little guy. In reality, it would be millions of little guys who pay the price along with rural Minnesota competitiveness. Again, I thank you for your efforts. Mr. <coughs> Chairman, members of the committee, thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Ms. Larson. Thank Welcome. you, Mr. Chairman, members. My name is Jill Larson with the Minnesota Business Partnership. I appreciate uh, Chair Dill giving us the opportunity to provide comments on your proposal. The Business Partnership agrees that a transportation system that effectively and efficiently moves people, goods, and services is important to our state's economic competitiveness. We also agree that there is a need for some additional investment in the state's transportation infrastructure. However, we believe the legislature con should consider alternative funding sources rather than the tax increases in this proposal. We do support the efficiency measures in the bill and the focus on expanding the use of public-private partnerships as an alternative funding source to supplement existing revenues. We also appreciate that the street improvement district fee was removed from the bill. <coughs> However, we do not support the tax increases in this proposal. Minnesota businesses already face very high tax and cost burdens. We have the third highest corporate income tax, the second highest personal income tax rate at the top bracket. We rank in the top five for business property taxes. The proposed gross receipts tax would give Minnesota the third highest fuel tax in the country. This is a 56% increase in the fuel tax after a 42% increase that was passed in 2008 <coughs> and after two, a $2 billion tax increase in just the last two years. Minnesota businesses currently pay 42% of all sales tax, taxes collected in the state and 39% of all motor, fu motor fuels. This increase in the bill will increase that burden. We evaluate these tax increases in the context of the overall tax burden in Minnesota. For example, in the, one of the handouts that you were given, Denver may have a higher metro sales tax, but Colorado's corporate and income tax rates are substantially lower than Minnesota's. With the nearly $2 billion surplus and the recent $2 billion tax increase, we believe the legislature should consider alternatives to raising taxes, including using some general fund dollars to supplement existing transportation revenues. We believe investments can be made without making our cost of doing business higher than it already is by imposing tax increases that are in this proposal. We view a reliable and efficient transportation system as a priority, and as a priority for the state, we believe it should be reflected as such in the state's general fund spending. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Larson. Uh, well, you, uh, you came in at 37 minutes, 37 minutes and about 30 seconds, so good job. All right, we'll, uh, we'll open up uh, uh, 10 more minutes for those um, who, who didn't sign up ahead of time to testify and give uh, members of the public uh, two minutes um, to, uh, to provide some of their thoughts and comments. Um, so yeah, anyone can just make their way to the table who'd like to provide a couple of minutes worth of testimony to the committee for the next uh, 10 minutes. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Good morning, Mr. Chair, uh, distinguished committee. My name is Heather Arndt, and I am a member of the, the public, and I have a handout. We will send someone up to take that for you and distribute it. Thank you. I wanted to take a, a few of your few moments of your time to address the public-private partnership pilot program, as uh, I've been able to review from the legislation online. Um, state statute 174.45 already allows the transportation commissioner to establish a joint program office to oversee and coordinate activities to develop, evaluate, and implement public-private partnerships involving public infrastructure investments. Therefore, I think um, I, I'm wondering why it would not the entirety of this whole section would not be uh, put into that subsection as opposed to listed separately. Um, I'm not sure why it's separate from the existing statute. As written from what I've been able to identify, the P3 pilot program <coughs> lacks the identified and quantifiable long-term goals. Right. Is it to show which types of P3s are best or worst, identify which are best for the state of Minnesota? Um, P3s, by their nature, involve a, a great level of detail and difficulty, especially when you look at longer-term programs. Uh, I think it would be well worth the due diligence of the uh, committee 
to, to make sure that the quantifiable and measurable objectives are listed in there. As I saw them, I did not see anything quantified and measurable. If this is a pilot program, I would think you would have definite benchmarks that you were hoping to <coughs> clear or not clear. Um, there is zero funding that's been associated in there for some of the things that are identified, such as hiring the contractors. Um, I think it's, you know, <coughs> considering the nature of this and the complexity of this, uh, I, I would certainly argue that due diligence and, um, and, and time is spent in ensuring that these are not uh, bad programs and I think that there's a good opportunity for public-private partnerships. I just wanted to emphasize the importance of this. And Senator Westrom, I had submitted this earlier, so you should have it on your, your e-reader. Great. Thank you, Ms. Arndt. I appreciate your, your time. Uh, would anyone else from the public like to testify? Welcome, uh, welcome <coughs> Mr. Bell. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, my father will be 93. Oh, Mr. Bell, please uh, introduce yourself for oh, the I'm record. Sorry. I'm with the American Council of the Blind of Minnesota. That's and, your my name. Name. and your name? Christopher Bell. Thank you. You'd think I'd learn after a while. Um, <laughs> my father is going to be 93 in June, and uh, he's worried that he might not get his driver's license renewed in a year and a half. Since he didn't pass the driver's license exam last time, but his doctor gave him a waiver, uh, who knows? But, you know, he's not going to benefit from public transit because his nearest neighbors are cows. Um, but there are going to be more and more people, either like me or older people, who have vision issues, and uh, you don't want them driving like I don't want my father driving. And if we don't have an effective alternative, then their desire for independence is going to make them try to continue driving, and that is not good for them or us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Mr. Larson. Welcome. Mr. Chair and members, uh, Dan Larson uh, with the Minnesota Rural Counties Caucus, uh, here, uh, uh, 29 rural counties uh, uh, in greater Minnesota. Uh, let me begin by saying that providing a steady, sustainable funding solution to the large and growing uh, road and bridge needs in greater Minnesota is the top priority of the Minnesota Rural Counties Caucus. So uh, we're excited to be able to acknowledge the leadership, the committee chair and the committee today. Uh, as we feel this package begins to address the large deficiencies and the growing transportation needs in greater Minnesota. So while this is a good package overall, uh, our focus is on local roads. And we want the committee to know that we believe the county state aid highway system is the backbone to the greater Minnesota economy and any key factor to, uh, or a key factor to any successful local, regional, or statewide economic development plan. So uh, we support significant new revenues distributed through the Highway Users Tax Distribution Fund. And we urge members to fund those significant new revenues with a mechanism like the gross receipts tax. So um, we, um, we've got examples of, uh, of counties that, uh, uh, while all counties benefited from the 2008 funding increase, there are counties we, uh, that, that did not benefit to the same extent. We think that uh, this mechanism will allow for that to happen. And um, given the interests of time, uh, I will leave it at that. But we hope that uh, you will consider this bill. And thank you for allowing me to testify.